two topics I want to hit today. One thing is just really emphasizing again this issue on the importance whoa, of, co of code contracts, okay? Um, specifications. And the idea here is, look, um, um, we separate interface from implementation. We have a we have a description of a unit of code, whether it's a class, whether it's a method, a whole module. Um, we spec we specify not just the code. We specify an interface. The interface describes sort of a contract that you can count on for this uh, piece of code. Okay. Um, it hides details. People count on these things being true, not all the implementation. And the idea here is by separating the implementation, the specifics of how you accomplish it from the interface, the what thing this does, you achieve a lot of benefits. Amongst other things, you can have locality. So um, uh, different pieces can be built separately because you have an understanding of what they need to do. Um, and you could have different people work on different pieces to fulfill um, to fulfill their their work without knowing the full implementation of the other. So if someone's working on foo and foo calls bar, all they need to know about is is the interface for bar. They don't need to wait until it's done implementation. Okay. Um, another thing is modifiability. This is going to be a huge thing, and I'm going to emphasize this. Man, this is like super examiner material exam material. What this buys you, it may not be obvious, but separating interface from implementation, the, what I promise you contract-wise from how I accomplish it, the vagaries of how I accomplish it, buffers parts of the program from change. In other words, one part of the program may change, the other doesn't have to. Particularly if I change the implementation of this thing, because you're not counting on the implementation, but just the, but the contract, you probably won't have to change at all. Even though you're you're using it, you're not counting on the things which are are up for change. Okay, and there's some opportunities for for reuse here. So a key need here is to to buffer us from the the risk of change. Um, and uh, you know I could. Uh, I, I could go into some examples here, um, but uh, fundamentally, there's a um, there's a risk that if we, for example, don't have an implementation, if all we know is there's a thing called sort, you pass values to and it gets back a sorted version of it. Um, if that's all we know about that thing, we don't know what other things are guaranteed. We may come to assume certain things. For example, in a bubble sort, it may be that you have things that are equal values initially being preserved in order. Whereas with a quick sort, that's not necessarily the case because this, this randomness fashion. And if I don't have a contract for sort, it's not clear what I can count on and what I can't. So I may come to rely on the fact that, yeah, if there's two values that are equal for the array I pass in, they're going to be equal in the return values um, for the sorted, sorted list. Um, or they're, sorry, they're going to have uh, the same ordering. And that may cause me to, to be surprised when sort changes from a bubble sort to a quick sort because suddenly my assumption is violated. Okay? Um, so the key here is that, look, knowing the signature or the name is, is grossly insufficient to protect users of that thing from being bitterly disappointed if that thing they're using evolves, if it changes, its implementation changes it. So what we're seeking here is a contract of sort where basically it's clear what you can count on from me and what you can't count on. The things you can count on, I can't change as the implementer. If you're, if, if, if I've, if I'm the creator of bar and you're using bar, I give you a contract. I say, you can count on these things about bar. And if it's not something you can count on, I can change it without, you, without worrying I'd break you. If it is something you can change on, I won't change it. OK? 
Okay, um, this is the basic idea. So we might have, you know, a a, a routine, and and we have an, a specification, a contract here, given a double array of values, returns an array consisting of the permuted indices. Uh, indices of the elements, the original array with the ordering of these indices being such that the elements at, uh, at these indices are arranged in ascending order, smallest to largest. Um, and it gives some preconditions, postconditions. Okay? So, contract defines some agreement. This contract I'm using more or less interchangeably with specification or, or with interface. An interface provides a specification, provides a contract generally. Um, and we can define these at very many levels. So there are some that provide what are called quality of service guarantees. Others are, are mostly type-based. Others are sort of semantic contracts. Generally, you want at least that, pre- and post conditions and variance and history properties. And these last two, I'm going to come back to for classes, because I, I gave reference to them a few days ago when we looked over your, the code. But the key point is, when it comes to classes, we don't really have preconditions, postconditions for the class as a whole. We might for a constructor or for a particular method. But what we have for the class as a whole is invariance and history properties. And you may be tested on them in your final exam. So, so we're going to see how to, how to reason about these. Okay? Um, and with specifications, you don't want too much detail to overwhelm people, turn them off. Um, uh, you know, TLDR, um, you don't want to make it too long for them to read. You, you, want, it, you want it to be concise, um, and you want to allow some flexibility with the implementation. You don't want to promise too much, but at the same time, you want to guarantee certain things that they may want to count on. Now, the key thing I want to emphasize from these slides, one of the key things is, look, there's big benefits of these things to two different groups, at two different points in time. Mark my words. Two and two. Okay? The two groups that benefit are the users of the abstraction and the creators of the abstraction. If I, as the creator of bar, provide a contract, then there's a number of benefits that accrue to me. And a couple of them are listed here. Um, so I can start writing code against this interface before the started writing other code, like test code, before the interface is implemented. Is implemented. Um, I get a clear understanding about what I can freely modify in the future as time goes on. Um, and uh, I know what features the users can be counting on. The creator of the abstraction particularly benefits from clarity as to what they have to implement. This is uh, a lot of the value of TDD. You're clear about what you need to implement within your code, what properties it needs to maintain, what, what guarantees it needs to maintain. And so when I write code, I write it to ensure those properties. Creators of abstraction, when they write the code initially and over time, they know what can be freely modified. As they, as time passes on, newer abstractions come out, faster algorithms to do certain things, um, you know, a whip fast native library for doing something on a certain platform or uses GPUs. Maybe I want to modify the implementation um, and I'm clear about what I can modify, what I can't, what people are counting on, what changes will break it, what changes won't. Okay? Um, so it's of help when I write the code, it's of help as I modify the code down the road. For users of the abstraction, what do they get? Well, look, they get guarantees on what things they can count on. What, what properties of this thing they're using can they count on? For example, are ties uh, retained in the, when things are sorted, are the ties uh, retained in the same order? Um, and by extension, it tells what things you can't count on. There's really no need for a guesswork, access to code base, and reading the code. Critically, these are benefits that occur at the earliest time, but also as time goes on with the, uh, uh, with the modifications to the code, um, those who use the abstraction can benefit. Uh, so they don't have to worry their code will break because the abstraction is evolving on which they're using. 
they don't have to worry that bar that they're coming on is going to break their code because it will change some property they're coming on. They guarantee the contract is insured on an ongoing basis. Okay. Um, so it's a lot of lot of benefits. Easier integration, easier understanding the code, clear documentation, uh, clarity as for testability. It allows you to test your code more easily, conceptual clarity, um, uh, easier debugging, um, and easier quality assurance. Okay? Um, uh, the many, many benefits. You directly derive assertion checks. Please give me assertion checks. Please give me assertions. Um, assertions now and assertions forever. Um, and it's clear what, what mocks uh, need to preserve. Okay. Now, this is where we're going. Less risk of violation of the Liskov substitution principle. So ladies and gentlemen, specifications, contracts, code contracts are highly, highly valuable constructs. And we're going to go see some examples of these constructs in spades in coming slides with the Liskov substitution principle. But you know, here are some examples. And what you'll see is preconditions, postconditions associated with the constructor, a particular methods here. It tells us what information it needs to, to, um, to you know, do its job and um, what postconditions it guarantees. Postconditions include return values. What other things can a postcondition include? Besides a return value. Um, yes, Mesa. Uh, some sort of a system or important state. Yeah, yeah, some aspect of, of the state that's updated. Uh, good. And in fact, often um, we deal with what are called effects or modifies clauses. Like, what does this modify? Evan, were you going to say something? Yeah, side effects. Yeah, side effects. And one particularly important type of you can describe it as a side effect and not without reason, is an exception. Exceptions that can be thrown. Okay? So we're going to be taking a look at these. But I want to switch over to Liskov substitution principle because we're going, this is all about how these specifications play a role in reasoning about subtypes and safe subtyping or behavioral subtyping. Okay, the idea here is look, we have a we have a subtype. One thing is a subtype of, of another. This could be a subclass, and that's fine. If, if you want to, for the sake of this lecture, go back to an example of this is a subclass. D is the subclass of C. I won't object strongly. It's more general than that. It has to do also with cases where this is an interface, and D implements that interface. But even though it's not a subclass of it, it's a, it's a subtype of it. Okay. Um, uh, so, so you know, we might here have uh, uh, D. Um, it's a, a subtype of C. Maybe foo is something that uses a C pass into it. And if I have some code bar that uses foo, maybe it creates a D subclass of C, a subtype of C. Right. In this case, it's a subclass. And then it calls foo with this D, right? This is polymorphism, right? We pass in the D as if it were a C, right? As far as foo is concerned, this is a C. It, it has all the appearance of a C. It treats it as a C. For all it knows, it's a C. Even though secretly, so that's a, it's apparent type and foo is a C, but its actual type is a D. Familiar territory? I hope so. I hope so. Okay. Um, okay. The Liskov substitution principle is a principle named after Barbara Liskov and Jeanette Wang. Uh, I was fortunate to take some lectures from uh, Liskov. Um, and these are uh, uh, quite famous uh, software engineering professors uh, at MIT and, and CMU. Um, uh, and Liskov substitution principle is a principle that's uh, key to recognizing when there's a legitimate subtyping relationship. It basically has to do with distinguishing genuine subtypes from fraudulent subtypes. Okay? And it reflects the need to reason 
the, the reason we need this is because we want to reason safely about use of polymorphism. We want to use polymorphism in a way that won't break our code, in a way that's safe, in a way that doesn't lead to bugs. We want to use polymorphism in a way that's provably safe. And the principle sounds a bit abstract. Okay? Let Q of X be a property provable about objects X of type T. Okay? T is the super type. Um, it's called C in my other in my other slide. Then Q of Y should be true about objects Y of the subtype um, of, of T. So if we have some property that's guaranteed for C, D needs to maintain that property. If we if we have C and any instance of C must maintain certain properties, certain characteristics. It has to observe certain regularities. Any instance of D also has to, because it can be passed around like a C. It can masquerade as a C. Okay. Um, in other words, subtypes have to maintain guarantees that that someone can reasonably infer being true from the supertype. Um, they have to stay true to the promises of the supertype. Because here, foo may be counting on the properties of a C. All it knows is something has been passed in like a C. It says, it's a C. I'm counting on these features of this C. Every C observes these properties. It has these guarantees associated with it. They don't know they've been passed a D. And to avoid introducing bugs in foo, it, any D that's passed on has to guarantee whatever C guarantees. If, if D goes off in some wacko way to not guarantee something C guarantees, and it passes it to Foo, Foo could be bitterly disappointed. It could be rudely surprised. Okay, let's, uh, we'll, we'll, um, um, we'll dig into this. Now look, LS, the Liscott substitution principle sounds restrictive, but it's just common sense. It's common sense. Uh, involving um, not introducing trouble, not leading to to disappointed expectations. Okay, to avoid bugs. Um, uh, and the idea is, look, people count on certain things about the supertype. Okay, they they count on certain things being true for C. Like this is immutable; that it won't change. Once you create it, it won't change. And if you pass them something which violates that, like you pass them a D, they're treating it as if it's immutable, and then somewhere in their code it changes out from under them, their code could break. Because they're counting on this thing being true, not having to check certain conditions, for example. Um, so uh, the, you know, the, the people who are relying on the features of the supertype shouldn't be disappointed by subtypes, okay? And if, if the subtypes violate those things they can be counting on reasonably, you'll break their code. And that means that you'll break potentially a lot of code when updating, when creating a new subtype or updating a subtype. Okay? Um, now, who relies on these specifications? Let's think about these interfaces. Think, you know, I showed you just a few minutes ago from this very podium, I showed you some interfaces here, right? Who relies upon this interface? So I have a read-only set, or I have an integer set, or I have a counter. Who relies on these things? I would argue there's two sets of individuals who rely on these things. One of them is users of these things. People create an instance of it and want to use it, right? I want to get a, a counter, and I'm going to use it, right? Um, I'm going to call increment on it, and I'm going to call get on it until the sum go down. Right? Um, I, I want to use this thing. The other sets of users for this, for these specifications, are none other than, you want to guess it? Hearing no volunteers. Um, otherwise, it may be people who implement subtypes of this. So, I have a counter. I'm going to implement my whiz bang counter. I'm going to implement my, you know, uh, uh, counter with pause or something like that. Not P A W S, but it's a pausing. Um, um, I'm going to implement my embellished counter, right? Um, 
Uh, and the deal is, if you don't provide specifications, people will jump to conclusions. If they can, what will they do? Look at the code. If they can't look at the code, what will they do? They'll guess. They'll try it out and say, what the hell, it looks like it works. Think it'll take a null. Let's pass it a null. Um, you know, um, oh, it didn't complain. That's good. Okay, um, let's, let's finish this ID5. Um, so, so here we're, we're worried about the, um, uh, we're worried about the uh, specifications rather than the issue of implementation. There's all other issues with subclass implementation that comes in. That's really an issue. That's really an issue. Um, we're not going to come for that this semester or today. Okay? Um, but you'll find videos if you talk about it from uh, 371 or from 470 in past years. Okay, I want to talk about a service contract because I want I want to make this very concrete. And you don't realize this is common sense. This is like day to day reason. Okay, so the idea is you're there's uh, a franchise of a delivery service. So maybe it's FedEx. Someone sets up a FedEx outfit uh, in East Saskatoon. And it's a franchise, so, so they own it. Um, but they're a FedEx outfit. Um, and they name theirs FredX, because they're Fred. Um, and so they, so, so they maintain FredX, okay? But it's a FedEx outfit. And um, given, given the guarantees of the parent company, in this case FedEx, what guarantees must FedEx adhere to to be legitimate? Okay, so suppose FedEx requires, if you go to the FedEx website, they require a customer to drop off a package by noon. Okay, um, to provide the, the requisite guarantees that come out of that. That's the precondition. To achieve the post condition, say it's delivery by 5 p.m. the next day anywhere in Canada, you have to drop the package off by noon the previous day. What does FedEx have to do? If, if that's what customers see on the FedEx website, that a customer must drop a package off by noon to get to the customer anywhere in Canada by 5 p.m. the next day. For the precondition, what could FedEx legitimately do? Could it stick to that exact thing, that exact, precisely the same criteria as its precondition? Yeah. Yeah, I could say, okay, you have to drop it for FedEx, same rules, right? Um, you have to drop it off by five, uh, by, by noon, right? Drop it off by noon to achieve this same um, post -gift. But is that all FedEx could do? What else could FedEx do reasonably? Well, they could make their cutoff later in the day. They could make their cutoff later in the day. That's right. Could a customer be bitterly disappointed having gone to the FedEx website, checked, okay, I need to get in by noon, um, and they're running late, and they don't get it to 12.30, they go in there, you know, fearing they've missed the boat, and they're told, no, this is, this is FedEx. We're, we're FedEx plus plus, right? Um, uh, we'll allow it till 2 p.m. or something. Will that customer be angry? Will they be bitterly disappointed? Will they have their expectations shattered? No, they won't. They'll actually be a rather pleasant customer in many cases, right? Um, okay, um, a, or if you prefer, a customer most pleasant, okay? Okay, but for the post condition, um, could FedEx adhere to the FedEx common post condition? Get it, get it delivered by 5 p.m. the next day. What could FedEx reasonably promise that would that uh, that would show extra levels of customer dedication? Sooner. Yeah, they could promise sooner. Um, yeah, we're FedEx, and you know we'll get it by dog sled and you know bush plane to there uh, by 3 p.m. Rain or shine. Whatever area of Canada, 
Goose Bay or you know uh, uh, you know north of Whitehorse or or up well, uh, way up uh, near Inuvik, you know, we'll get it there by 3 p.m. They could. What could they not do, though? Well, look, could, I say, illegal franchise. Suppose Fred X had its rule. The customer has to drop off their package at, at, a, Fed, at a Fred X. They have to, the customer must drop off the package by 9 a.m. Could a customer be rudely surprised? Yeah, so they look up online, you know, at 8 a.m. before they go to work, they're trying to figure out their day, they see, okay, for FedEx, you have to drop it off by, for FedExes in general, you have to drop it off by noon and say, okay, no problem. I'll, I'll take an early lunch at 11.30 and I'll get over to FedEx. Then they come in to FedEx and the proprietor says, well, we're FedEx. Um, and you have to get it to us by noon, by nine rather. Could they be disappointed? Yeah, because they're counting on this property of, of a FedEx oh, um, in, in general. Okay, for post conditions, what, what guarantees would disappoint a customer, would be illegal? For post conditions. Give me an example of a post condition that would disappoint your customer or would risk it. Yes, Will, speak on. Not delivered till like 7 p.m. Yeah, not delivered till 7 p.m. or midnight the next day or something like that, right? Um, next year. <laughs> How about, right? Um, <laughs> we'll get it, we'll get it on the, the slow sled or something like that, right? Um, uh, we only go ice roads and it's it's early summer now, so we'll have to wait till it freezes over. Um, uh, so, so here, you know, we have a FedEx, and then we have these FedEx franchises, and um, you know, FedEx franchise one uh, provides really good service. It allows for greater flexibility and precondition in a legitimate direction. And yeah, post condition that that's. Um, that is acceptable. Um, uh, this next one provides, um, you know, a uh, the same criteria for precondition um, and postcondition the next day. Okay, so the Liskov substitution principle is all about recognizing are these franchises or subtypes legitimate instances of the supertype, and it has everything to do with just the reasoning we're talking about. But Preconditions, postconditions, but extends beyond that to invariance and history properties. So I'm going to be pushing through this in a whirlwind way. There's basically four, no, three major issues that um, that you got to deal with. Um, so method signature compatibility. You have to have signatures for the methods that are corresponding for supertype, super, subtype. Um, the methods of the subtypes must behave appropriately, and then subtypes have to preserve provable properties of the supertype. That last one is more tricky to reason about. Okay. Um, this, by the way, the second one involves uh, preconditions, postconditions. Okay. Um, okay. So, so the first thing is you need to have signatures. Okay. And this requires subtypes to have method signatures that are compatible with supertypes. It could be the same, but in general for modern programming languages, in Java it has to be the same. If you have a class C and it has um, a, 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 a method foo that takes a collection and then you create a subtype, of C, and it has the method foo that's, that's overridden, it needs to take a collection. But for modern languages, that's not necessarily true. The subtype, in fact, could take a broader set of objects, but it has to accept all things accepted by the superclass. Just like the Fred X any package that will be accepted by FedEx, FredEx has to accept. But it may accept other packages. It may accept packages later, for example. Okay? 
Um, so it can weaken or preserve the, the parameters. No, no, I say parameters here, okay? Um, so, so if the supertype has a method bar that takes in a, a set, it can work on a set, takes it in as a parameter. The subtype could take in a, any old collection. It can deal with sets, but it can deal with more. It can handle more. It has more flexibility with respect to parameters. The opposite is true for return types. Mind you, this is what's called contravariant. As you go down the, the, the hierarchy of types, you become more specialized in the hierarchy. You get subtypes and sub-subtypes. The parameters can only get more general in their types. Like it's super types. You go from the super type having bar taking a bar taking a set, and the subtype it could take a collection. It can also take a set, but it could take a collection. By contrast, return types you have covariance. So the return type can only be the same as or more restrictive than the super type. So if bar returns in the super type a a a uh, let's say an int, in a subtype, an integer, let's say, uh, reference type integer, then in the subtype, excuse me, if in the supertype it takes uh, a, you know, returns any old object, then the subtype here could return an integer, actually. And that's fine because it is a, um, it, it is an object, okay? Um, and similarly, exceptions can only be more restrictive. We'll see this. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so I have a super type. It takes process, string, string, okay? Um, okay, so subtype one. Um, so this is rows exception one and so on. Here's a legitimate subtype one. Exactly the same signature. See that? Same signature. Same, same. Yeah? This is legitimate. Fine. This is kind of vanilla, you know, old hat sort of stuff. How about this one? Subtype 2 here. My legitimate subtype 2. Kind of gives it away, right? This one can take in an object instead of just a string. It returns an object and it, it returns an exception 1 subtype. Is this legitimate? Yeah, it is. Look, if someone calls this process on the subtype, thinking that they have an instance of the supertype, they, but the, they actually secretly have an instance of the subtype. And they call process on it. And they pass it a string. It will happily accept the string. It will accept any sort of object. Great. It will accept the string. It will return a string, so they won't be disappointed with what they've gotten back. They're expecting a string back from the super type, and they get a string back. Or if there's an exception that's a subtype of exception one, they won't be disappointed because they're ready for an exception one. If it's a subtype, they, they, anything that handles exception one will handle it. So this is perfectly legitimate. How about this one? Um, uh, subtype one. Process here takes a string and returns an object. Could someone calls my fraudulent subtype one be disappointed if they if all they know is this is an instance of my my super top? If that's the apparent type. Could they be disappointed? Could they be shocked? Could they be really surprised um, by, by calling process of something that secretly, unbeknownst to them, it's a my fraudulent subtype one? They could be really surprised because they're expecting back a string and they get an object. Oh my gosh, it's an object. I don't know what to do with this. This is some wacko, you know, integer or whatever. Give me a hash tree, uh, you know, uh, uh, a hash set back, or it gave me, you know, a dictionary, or it gave me a, a splay tree back, right? Some some wacko thing. Similarly, could this be disappointed if 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 they're anticipating as being a super type? They have an instance what they think is my super type, and they call it, and they somehow get warned. Oh, you have to give a double. It it doesn't process a string. Could they be upset? Yeah, because all they know is it's a super type. And, you know, they would say, that's a fraud. Just as much as 
you know, if, if FedEx, if Fred X, if Fred X said, you know, you walk into Fred X and, and they say, sorry, you're three hours too late. You say, wait, I'm, I'm here just before noon. They say, no, in Fred X, we were for all packages by 9 a.m. Someone, the customer could legitimately say, you're not a FedEx. You're a fraud, right? True or not? Okay, well, I'll leave it to your imagination. Um, but so it is here that someone could say, you're not uh, my super type. You're a fraud. This is a, a fraud here. Um, it's Pat, you're, you won't even take a string as an argument. You're, you're not implementing this interface. You're, you're off in la-la land, right? Um, same thing with this, um, you know, where you're throwing another exception. Say, so, but wait, I'm counting on this. All I know. My method is counting on being a my super type. I don't even know this type exists. Someone gave it to me as if it was one of these. It's masquerading. And then it threw this exception too, which I'm not ready for. I could be rudely disappointed. Could I not? Yes. Okay. Heads nod, not purely due to lack of sleep. So that's a good sign. Okay. Um, okay. Second requirement. So we talked about signature compatibility. In today's language landscape, you cannot assume a subtype has the same signature. For older languages, yeah. Newer languages, you can't assume. They have to adhere to principles as governed here. Okay? Um, second thing is subtypes must behave in ways that are consistent with those of the supertype. Look, subtype methods must behave like calls to the respective supertype method. If you call a method that's secretly on a subtype, Someone's passed you an instance of a subtype, as, and all you know is that it, the apparent type is the supertype, and you call the method. You shouldn't be really disappointed that the subtype method does something wildly different. Okay? Um, um, so the method and the subtype can only weaken or maintain preconditions and strengthen or maintain postconditions. Same basic rule as for the parameters in return values slash exceptions. Okay? Uh, it's the same basic principles as the signature rule that are applying. Okay, um, so look, um, the idea here is um, with FredX, someone who's coming in there shouldn't have to know all the quirks of, of this franchise. You know, all they should know is that this abides by FedEx rules. And if it has extra latitude, that's great. But it, if they're all they're counting on is FedEx rules, they should be fine. The the, the customer. Okay, um, and we'll see some instances of that second rule. The third thing is subtype interface has to preserve provable properties of the supertype interface. Provable properties. And it turns out the last two of these definitely require specifications. They require contracts. They require interfaces. Let's go into this, okay? So the property rule, this preserving properties, ladies and gentlemen, of the supertype, there's basically two big types of properties we maintain for classes or, or types. Invariants, these are things that always have to be true. At any one time, these are true. Anytime you can check, this is true. The other is what's called a history property. And this, you check not at any one time, but at two points in time, say one before the other, T1, T2, and you test does this history property apply between T1 and T2? For example, the history property may be the value only stays the same or rises. So if we check it earlier and we check it later, the value later can only be the same as or greater than the value earlier because it can only stay the same or rise. Another example of a history property is something that doesn't change. It's immutable. It never alters. And there's many good reasons for building immutable objects. You don't have to do defensive copies of them. They're type safe and you can reason about them much more easily. You can build things out of them quite a bit more easily than out of immutable things, etc. Compilers can optimize them better, etc. Um, so here we're going to be dealing with this need to 
to reason about what things we can come from. Okay? So like you can't change an immutable supertype to immutable subtype. Not a behavior, uh, legitimate behavioral subtype. Not a safe subtype. You can't add delete to a supertype that only supports inserts. Can't. When I say you can't, it's not legitimate. You will break code if you do this. You will be skating on thin ice. And you're lucky if you have ice at all. Um, so uh, you will break code willy-nilly. You will, you will break other people's programs or your own. Um, can you do it in Java? Of course you can. Can you do it in languages? Of course you can. Um, right now. Compilers don't have the wherewithal to detect all these properties. But you will break code. And that's why it's up to us, ladies and gentlemen, as software engineers of the new generation, to make sure these properties are maintained in rigor with rigor and maintained with clarity. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. Here's a base type, counter. I can get it, and I will get an int. So a counter maintains an integer count, okay? It initially starts as zero. Hmm? I can get the value, I'll get back an int, and I can increment the value. Would it increment it? What do you think? By? Well, it's not a very good specification, I'll tell you that. Increment, okay, I'll tell you, increment it by one, but this is poorly described. Okay, here's counter two. This purports to be a subtype of counter one. So counter two um, starts at zero, and the effective increment is to double the current value. Can I pass this legitimately, counter two, legitimately around as a subtype of counter one, of counter rather? Can I, if, if I have code that depends on a counter, it, it's past a counter, all it knows it has a counter, and I secretly, somewhere else in the program, I, I allocate a counter two, and I feed it in, I give it a counter. I give it to this code, which is coming on the counter. Could it be really surprised by this? What could it do that might cause disappointment? Yeah, Mason. So after you increment, you expect it to be greater than that, but it's going to start to zero, it's actually the main. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, no, this is not an appropriate subtype. It, in fact, this won't even, <laughs> it will always be zero, right? Because doubling, okay, how about counter four? Here's counter four. It purports to be a subtype of counter as well of counter. Ignore counter two for this, for this example of counter four. So counter four purports to be a subtype of counter. And it just provides an extra method that's called double value. Beyond what counter provides, it provides get and it provides increment. It just, maybe it inherits them. Let's say it's a subclass, so it inherits those, okay? But it also provides double values. Is this a legitimate subtype? Yeah, yeah. It, do, does it break any of these methods? No, in terms of, in terms of um, preconditions, postconditions, no. In fact, these methods aren't overridden at all. Does, not affected at all. Is there something that you would expect to hold for counter that doesn't hold for this? No. I mean, any value you could get through a counter for, you could get through a counter, right? Okay, maybe you, you call increment at first, and then some other code that knows it's a counter for causes double value, and it goes from one to two, and they call it again, it goes to four. But you could have gotten a four through counter. So it's not like, you can get in some weird state with counter four you can't get to here. There's no property about counter you couldn't get to with, um, from counter, that you can get to with counter four you can't get to with counter. Do you see that? Okay, let's try this. So is that a legitimate subtype? Yes, it is. Counter three. Okay, here, all we have is a different constructor. We can start with the value n, an int that's n. We add some extra flexibility. What's not to like? We add some extra flexibility by starting with an arbitrary integer. Is this a legitimate subtype of counter?
Well, if you made that like forever an optional one, where it was by default set to like in Python, you should say n equals zero. Yeah. Would it then be a legitimate subtype? Well, uh, good question. I will. <laughs> I want to check other people's reasoning. Mason. Pass it a negative. Could you ever get a negative by counting? No, there's an invariant here that's always the case. So whatever number is in counter, it's less than or equal, oh sorry, it's greater than or equal to zero. Could you get a negative by counter three? Yeah, pass it. So this can lead to situations where someone who only knows all the world, the only class they know about in the world is counter. They don't know that somewhere, somewhere else in the world, someone created a counter three and it got passed to their code. When they wrote their code, all that existed was counter. And someone eventually wrote counter three and passed it in with a negative value. And their code, which is counting on it being zero or more, breaks. Could you imagine that happening? Yeah, it, it could. It could. It would not be good. Um, particularly the night before ID five is due. Um, Counter five, how about this? Decker positive. So basically it decrements it. It can lower it. Okay? Um, it requires that the value be greater than zero. So it will never go negative. But it it provides this extra method, just an extra method of like double value up here, for example, in, in counter four. Um, it's an extra method that decrements it. Is that a le legitimate subtype of counter? Well. Is the history property you were talking about earlier something that you have to declare explicitly or can it be implied? If you don't declare it, people may assume it anyway. So it's in your interest to declare it if you are guaranteeing preserving it. If you are not guaranteeing preserving it as the creator of a counter, you can actually say, no, users should not assume this history property. And then you as creator of a counter would have the opportunity at a time of your choosing, at your election, you could, you could uh, then you know, change it and change that so, because you know no one's coming. But if it is something that people might conclude, it's in your interest to be very clear about it, that we are adhering to it. So anyone who modifies counter knows that this is guaranteed. And anyone who uses it can be very clear that it's guaranteed. So omitting it just muddies the water. And declaring it one way or the other saying don't count in or do makes, starts to make it clear. But is this a legitimate subtype of counter? Why not? Yeah, I, I, yeah, Mason? Yeah, it never should decrease in value. So this is a history property thing. If you know it at one time, you know it at a later time, its value should always be the same or greater. Right? And, and suddenly that's violated. Could someone possibly be writing code with counter that counts on it only staying the same or incrementing? Yeah, you have a loop and you're, you know, you're, you're keeping track of it to refer to an index in some array or something, and you know it's never overwriting earlier elements because its value is either staying the same or rising, and this will violate that. So if you pass this in, counter five, pass it in as if it's a counter, masquerading as a counter, someone whose code knows only about counters, could be counting on the properties of counters, which is that it's never going to decrease, and their code could develop a bug. Because suddenly, somewhere else in the program, it's calling decrement positive in a way that's leading it to, to actually go down, and their code is getting the, um, getting the consequences, okay? So look, the, the key here is ask, is there any way a user of the apparent class could be rudely surprised by the behavior of the, of the, of the subclass, right? If someone only knows that it's a, the apparent class, a super type, could they be shocked, thrown off, be caused a bug by, by the subtype? Something that appears impossible given the super type 
is made possible by the subtype in a way that would violate their assumption. Okay? Um, these concerns arise, this relates to Will's comment, regardless of whether you have a formal specification or not. Formal specifications just make you less, less vulnerable to them by making it very clear, can you count on this or can you not count on it? So that both sides are very clear, the implementers of the abstraction and those who use it and those who subtype it, okay? Um, all three of those. Um, uh, and it can be very helpful to informally state implications. But just be aware, if you give a, a smart software developer this, this interface and they use it as a key part of their architecture month after month, whether you, whether you state it explicitly or not, like, you're going to probably come to depend on this. I mean, software developers are resourceful, they'll think, okay, you know, um, that's really interesting, it can never go down. So its value now has to be at least what it was earlier. So I can cut out this if statement in my code. I don't have to worry about it overriding earlier values that index because it, it never decreases. It, it's always above zero. I know that. You know, we, we use these things as tools of our trade and we come to count on their properties just as much as a, as a craftsman in the, in the physical trades will come to count on the properties of a saw or of a you know, of a, of a uh, jackhammer or what have you. And um, if we go about substituting in fraudulent versions of them, just as much as uh, that, uh, that individual in the trades could be damaged, could be injured, um, so it is we can injure our code, okay? I'm gonna give you some other examples here that I don't have time to, to cover, but I'd suggest you look at them before next time, okay? Um, because examples like these, why don't you go through these, uh, this one, my counter two, dual counter, swappable counter, how's that? Um, uh, so is my counter two in a subtype of counter? Is dual counter a subtype of counter? Is swappable dual counter a subtype of dual counter? Um, um, and uh, uh, go through this uh, example three as well, okay, in bag. And we'll discuss them beginning of class next time. Okay? But now it is my turn, <laughs> as is the natural order of things, to allow the next generation to take the stage of life. Um, and